She was awarded Prix Carmignac du photojournalisme last year. Fabiola Ferrero focused on her home country, Venezuela, and its human societal and environmental challenges. She joins us now. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Today I'm going to be showing the project I Can Hear the Birds. Uh, it's a project that I started a few years ago, about six years ago. And, uh, but before I go into the actual project, I think it's very important to give some historical context on Venezuela and the history of oil. Because everything in the project and everything that, that is related to Venezuela in some way is related to our oil history. So I decided to start with this picture in particular. This is a, a picture of a historical event we had in 1922 called El Reventón, which essentially means there were some oil workers uh, working on a well, and the well suddenly exploded. And this is a column of about 40 meters high of oil. Um, and it was like this for about nine days. So this uh, men that you see, these are foreigners. They're not Venezuelan. They're part of the Dutch Shell Company that they were working on the well when it exploded. And after about nine days, it finally stopped. But that's the moment where, when the world realized the potential that Venezuela had to exploit resources, and particularly oil. And so after that, it, bec it began this process of um, very rapid modernization, and a lot of it has to do with foreign oil companies, particularly American companies. This is Nelson Rockefeller. He was the head of Standard Oil Company, Creole Petroleum Com Corporation, and they're one of the biggest uh, companies that, that worked on the exploitation of petroleum or oil back home in Venezuela. He's vacationing in his 100,000 acre farm in the center of Venezuela. And this is in the 1950s, and this is when really a narrative of an all positive progress narrative started around the ideal of what Venezuela was supposed to be. So it, be it begins with oil, and even today, everything that you see in Venezuela has to do with oil. Um, this is an ad from the 1950s. This is Canadian Club, it's a whiskey brand. And they created this whole um, kind of comic happening in Lake Maracaibo, which is where most of the oil extraction happens. And one of the, so the story basically says, well, these American oil workers, they get really hot when they're uh, you know, working on the oil fields back in Venezuela, so they need to cool off with a little whiskey shot. Um, and so it starts to build this whole idea of, look at this country in South America blooming, and it's uh, starting to grow, and we became f famous not only for having the biggest oil reserves in the world, but also later, it's beauty queens. Venezuela also holds the record of m the most beauty uh, pageant crowns in the world. And so it was a mixed narrative of this country that has beautiful women, it has oil, and also this paradise, uh, beaches, and, and natural places. And so I grew up in the 90s, which is a very different time frame, because bef right before that is when the fantasy that was created around this idea that, well, we have oil, so we basically have the future guaranteed, that's when it starts to crumble in the 90s, until, well, what we see nowadays that has happened to Venezuela. And so I grew up with this idea of sort of missing a future that happened before I was even born. Missing this wonderful, um, romanticized idea that an oil-rich nation could never go wrong. And these are pictures taken in those oil fields that were originally built for the American oil workers. So you can see these houses. Everything was built specifically, you know, it's an American way. By then, oil had been uh, nationalized. So this is actually a Venezuelan family that was living in one of those oil fields. And so I start my search. I start because, uh, well, I was born and raised in Venezuela. My whole family left the country, and I started to react to what was happening around me. I'm sure most of you have seen some, in some level, news of Venezuela in the past five, even maybe more years, of the biggest economic crisis that we've had in, in, in this 100 years of oil industry and oil um, history. 
And so when I started to document working mainly as a photojournalist, I also realized that I wasn't, I wasn't only documenting a, an economic crisis, I was also trying to portray sort of a sense of loss and trying to understand what that sense of loss really was. Um, I was obviously thinking, well, I, 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 feel, I feel a grief because my house slowly started to empty, to become, become empty. The, the places that were once my brother's bedroom or my parents' bedroom were now completely um, unoccupied. But it was also, I realized later on, it was a quest to search for that, the glimpses of the memories of that future that I never got to see and that my generation never got to see. For them, it's mismanagement of a lot of things, including, of course, our natural resources and our relationship to, to different other um, entities involved, including, of course, the United States. Um, so I started, obviously, to visit these oil fields this is how they look like nowadays. This is Lake Maracaibo, where you saw the ad from the 1950s, where the Canadian oil whiskey um, was portrayed. And in the middle of this whole um, search that I had, kind of also wanting to portray the search of Venezuelans for a sort of normality, which is also part of the things that got lost in the way. This, of course, brings, well, obviously, a lot of social uprisings and riots, and this is mostly what makes the news. Um, and I think also working as a photojournalist is when I realized that there was something missing or something that falls short when you're walking, working as a photojournalist and realize that there's only so much you can tell when you're documenting the present. There's only so much you can show to people uh, about what's going, what's going on. And so I started this whole archival research to try to make people understand where this narrative comes from and, and why to me it's so important to try to go back to the past to understand where we are today. This is one of the universities. It's also a really big part of the project. One thing that has been definitely been destroyed is the universities in Venezuela, the public autonomous universities in Venezuela. Um, and there are also symbols of that lost prosperity that we had, because this is not, we're not only talking about the economical prosperity, we're also talking about the progress of ideas, of intellectual development, of, of uh, society in general, and also of the rising middle class during the 80s and the, and the 70s and 80s. And this is uh, Universidad de Oriente, it's one university that over the years has been looted, destroyed, and today the um, teachers teach from their homes. They literally just put a board in their garage and they went from having about 40 students per room, now they have about four students. This is obviously because of the, this, the destruction of the infrastructure, but also the migration, the massive migration of Venezuelans. For those who don't know, well, Venezuela now has about seven million migrants around the world, myself included, my family included. But obviously, sorry if I'm talking too much, but, um, but obviously in the middle you also see very, just like glimpses of hope as well, and, and glimpses of that past that I mentioned. This is Dr. Raul Esteves, he's a teacher of another university that was also destroyed. He's over 80 years old, he's still teaching, and this picture was taken in uh, an institute that he built in, in the Andean region of Venezuela. It's a geophysical lab, and everybody but him left the country. So now he's just trying to keep something alive which to him is complicated because he says, well, I have all this knowledge and there's no new generation to pass it to. So I think the loss goes way beyond, you know, the, the economic um, success that we had in previous years.
I'm just going to leave you to watch the rest, and I'll stop if there's something else to say. This is a, a drawer in one of the houses that I visited. Another important part of the investigation was visiting the house that migrants leave when they decide to leave the country. My family also has a, an empty house back home because Venezuelans have this sort of nostalgic um, nature to us that we, people, a lot of people, especially middle class people, leave the country always thinking that eventually they're gonna come back. They don't just leave. And I was working with this woman whose job is to empty out the houses that the migrants leave behind. So eventually when they realize that they're not going to come back, they call her and they, you know, they tell her, show us everything that's in the house and we'll tell you what we want, we'll tell you what can be donated, we'll tell you what can be thrown away. And in each house, she tells me, she finds a drawer like this. These are coins and for those of you who don't know, Venezuela also went through a hyperinflation process recently, which means that all of this money is essentially worthless. And so this woman, what she does is she gets all the coins and she sells it for the material, which is worth, worth a lot more than the value that the coins were supposed to have. This is also one of the houses. This is actually very close to Lake Maracaibo, where the oil extraction happens. And because it's so close to the, to the, oil, to the lake, the whole terrain is, is sinking, so the house is literally broken in half. Um, and this, this is a person that used to work in the oil fields with the American families. She was a teacher in one of the schools. So basically what happened was this. This house that I showed you at the beginning, the White House, um, is part of a neighborhood that, used, that was built specifically for the oil workers. And they were Americans, so it, was, it resembled the American neighborhoods that you would see um, in the movies, for in, in our case. Um, and so this is one of those houses today on the inside. Et voilà. Um, I guess that's it. I don't know if there's like time for questions or no. No, okay, good. Um, well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fabiola. Amazing work.